All right. The Lord be with you. All right, let us pray. Lord, we thank you that when we pray, things happen, doors open. Lord, uh, we just thank you for this opportunity to wrap up our confirmation class. I thank you for everyone uh, who's participated, Lord, and we just ask that you would continue to guide our discussion and teach us the things that would be most beneficial to draw us closer to yourself. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so today we are on um, class eight, the family tree, Anglican distinctives. Tim, can you move it to the, or Chris, in the next one? And can you turn the volume down so we don't have to hear it, but that it projects? Thanks. Okay. So the nature and mission of the church. The Bible describes the church in various relational ways that emphasize both its call to gather for worship and to be Christ's ambassadors in the world. What's an ambassador? Representative, right? So an ambassador represents someone else and does their bidding, okay? Um, the nature of the church is to renew the power to love within us through spirit-filled worship so that in loving God above all else, which is worship, we would love our neighbor as ourself, one deeply loved by God. And the church's mission is to share the gospel with others, inviting them into a relationship with Jesus, all Christians have been given gifts to build up the church in love and better enable it to live into its nature and mission. Okay. So that was kind of a summary of last week. Uh, remember, we shared um, one of the things I was taught by one of my mentors, that this whole idea of sharing the love of Christ with others, um, the best thing to convey first, rather than this amazing news, is that you actually care about the other person. Because people don't care what you know until they know what you know that you care. And so that's, that's a big thing. So if our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is relational, then in all that we do in ministry and mission needs to be relational focus. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one, please. All right, uh, talk amongst yourself. Why is it important or at least, very least, helpful to know your family's history? be beneficial about knowing where your family comes from and these other things. Any ideas? Well, for your health. <laughs> okay. Genetics. Okay, health. You could know genetics. So that's a good point. I wasn't even thinking about that. Like if you know that so-and-so is predisposed to this, okay, so genetically speaking. How about emotionally and spiritually speaking? But, but why would that be important? That was probably the best sound I've heard all day. Right there. So, um, well, I think it's, you know, and again, for me, I'm thinking, you know, if you come from a family that has a history of suicide, mental disease, something like mm -hmm. that. Okay, so mental illness, uh, emotional instability, these types of things, history of suicide, that would be good too, okay? Carry traditions on, good, okay? To know your culture, right? Good, very good, okay. So here's one thing to also, it, it can be helpful. In my book, I've, I've mentioned to you the emo emotionally healthy spirituality. Um, he talks about in there, and I, this was, uh, th there's a whole way of understanding the human person, right? So um, from a, a kind of social science perspective. So um, 
many of us will seek counseling at times in our lives and it can be very helpful. Oftentimes counseling, or a lot of the approaches to counseling had always been, here's an individual with a problem, let's focus on the individual to get them well. But then uh, this man, Murray Bowen, came up with this uh, theory that you can't understand, truly understand a person outside the context of the family in which they live in. So it's this family systems theory that you can only really understand um, and help a person grow when you enable them to understand where they come from, their family of origin. So it was not, you know, he wasn't a Christian. It didn't really have a spiritual component to it. But then a rabbi took that and applied it to a congregation, right? And so um, very helpful. And basically what it, it says, it talks about generational sin, right? That, you know, there's a sense that God's going to forgive us when we repent, but in Exodus, it says that that sin, even though it's forgiven, will carry down through the generations. So it's helpful to know what are some of the, the patterns of behavior that have existed throughout the generations in our family. Because it's the most powerful force that affects our behavior. Um, this is what the social sciences have said, and I think that the Bible would say it as well, is that um, what shapes and forms us the most is our families of origin, okay? Um, and then I would say probably second is culture, right? The, the force of the world on us. And so one of the reasons why it's really helpful to know this is many of us had some really good experiences and all of us have had some challenging experiences in our family of origin, right? Um, but what can happen is we can begin to live our lives based upon some of these things that we, and I don't, more, you know, they say more is caught than taught, right? Like uh, some of the things that I carry forward with me to this day, I don't think my dad intended to teach me. It was what I caught, right, because of the environment. Same with my mom, right? But that can lead us into some pretty entrenched ways, and entrenched meaning just maybe unaware, ways of responding to the world and how we go about things that if we don't become aware of them, we may be living our lives, let's say our family life, in a way that we just assume is normal because that's the way we were raised, and it actually doesn't line up with the kingdom of God. And so part of knowing where we're from is helpful because it can give us um, uh, in like inroads to where greater freedom may exist for us and greater faithfulness, okay? So why are we talking about this? Well, because now we're going to look at the family tree of the Anglican church. And I will tell you what, it is not squeaky clean. Um, and that's okay because neither are we, but that's just a full disclosure up front. All right, let's go to the next one. Thank you. All right, so here's our little video because... If you're, n all right, just real quick, if you're new to Anglicanism um, and you tell somebody, oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm you know, part of the Anglican church, and then, like, if they have some historical knowledge, of the Church of England, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, because of whom, what, pretty, Henry VIII, right? That is almost, that, I mean, actually, that is every time what people say. So we're going to watch a little uh, video clip and see what this has to say, which is pretty much what we just said. And now we're taking another hundred year stride through history. And this is Hampton Court, home to the most famous of all English kings. We're talking overweight. We're talking Tudor. We're talking six wives. Exactly, Henry VIII. And how does Henry fit into this story we're telling, this story of power and of how people were ruled in England? Well, I'll tell you. Do you remember the Becket story? Henry II takes on the power of the church and Becket ends up dead on the cathedral floor. Well, 400 years later, his namesake, Henry VIII, took on the power of the church again. And this time, he won. By 1528, Henry had been married to Catherine of Aragon for 20 years but he fancied Anne Boleyn, her lady-in-waiting. To divorce Catherine, he needed the permission of the church, which was controlled, remember, by the Pope in Rome. 
and the Pope refused. What happened next was that Anne Boleyn gave Henry a book, and it was a banned book. It was illegal even to possess it, and it was written by a man called William Tyndale. Tyndale criticized the Pope. He dreamt of a new kind of Christianity that would sweep away the power of the earthly church and simply get back to people worshiping God with no church in between. And this book planted a seed in Henry's mind because he realized if there was no Pope, he could get his divorce. And so just because Henry wanted to marry his mistress, the church in England split from the Church of Rome. This is Revo in Yorkshire, one of numerous abbeys, monasteries, priories, closed down in what's now known as the Reformation. It was all perfectly legal. Henry went to Parliament and he was declared the supreme head of the English church and he set to work destroying the church's earthly power. And most of the MPs went along with it because they, like Tyndale, mistrusted the power and wealth of the church but also the church had land. There was a killing to be made here, carving up the church's lands. The Reformation was the greatest land grab since the Norman conquest. And with all this new land, the power of the landed gentry in the 16th century rose yet further. But what made the Reformation so exciting was its impact on ordinary people. I've come to St. Michael's in Copford Green in Essex, not just to admire these magnificent wall paintings, but to show you this. It's a rood screen, not R-U-D-E, rood, but R-O-O-D. And in churches before the Reformation, screens like this separated the people who sat down there from the altar. Only the priest could approach the altar because remember, the church taught that only through the church, through the priests, could the people be with God. And the Reformation tore down these barriers between God and the people. And for the first time, people came to believe there was nothing separating them from God. God was with them. And this idea filled them with energy. It gave them hope. And another thing that happened with the Reformation, Bibles, for the first time, were printed in English. Before then, they'd all been in Latin. And when people came to read the Bible for themselves, what did they find? Wonderful stories of a man called Jesus, who came to give hope not to the rich, but the poor. And stories of bad kings punished by God. So yes, the Reformation made Henry more powerful, but he had opened a can of worms. Okay. So according to the video, who was the key figure in the history of the Anglican Church? Henry VIII. Okay. But from all we've studied, who do you think is actually the key figure of the Anglican Church? Oh, in the back, we have Jesus Christ. And that way, uh, Jesus Christ isn't in the back. He's with us in our... Yes, right answer. Thank you, Tim. Okay. So, but I wanted to show that because it's really important that we acknowledge, right, um, and we're going to look at some dates here where I think that the way, and when I took church history and the history of the church in England, right, so there had been an undercurrent for, gosh, a couple hundred years even for reform of the church that began in England, right? Tyndale, who he's, you know, he mentioned there, was someone from England who ended up going to the continent. Um, so there was this desire that was present. Henry VIII used that desire, right, for his own gain, um, because if, every, if there wasn't that kind of sense of wanting a change amongst the clergy, it wouldn't have happened. Um, so there was kind of certain things that were in place. Um, and like it said, uh, what we see the main benefit was its effect on people like you and I, right? That, that there was no longer this separation, like that the gospel actually was unleashed again within the church, 
meaning that nothing separates us, right, between the love of God. And you don't need, you guys don't need clergy to be in relationship with Jesus, right? We are just following Jesus with you, set aside to do certain acts within the church, okay? Whereas you could see within the Roman Catholic system, that wasn't the case. You became dependent upon the church's ministry. All right, uh, next one, please. All right, so yeah, here again, it shows us the main focus of the church. Remember we talked about the universal church, right? All those trusting in Jesus throughout time. Um, and that's, at its best, being an Anglican is seeking to try to be as faithful to what the universal church is as described in Scripture. Um, no sin-free zone, right, in the planet, in the world right now. So we're going to have problems within our church, which we do. Okay, but it ultimately goes back to God's love in creating us and Jesus' willingness to sacrifice himself as the sacrificial lamb so that we can experience new life, which will lead to resurrection life. Okay. All right, Tim, the next one. All right, so where does the Anglican church fit in the big picture of church history? All right, let's go to the next one. This is just going to be, um, so first thing, the laying on of hands. Remember last week we did a review of the Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral, quadrilateral and the apostolic, the episcopate, right? The sense of having bishops. The church in England did a lot um, to trace back, right, the fact that every bishop that had been ordained went originally all the way back to the apostles, right? And that, that's what the Roman Catholic Church would say. I think the same of the Eastern Orthodox because they were formed in the early times but that those who'd been set apart in leadership had all had hands laid upon them, like we see here. Okay? So they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And there they're talking about Jewish priests. Okay? So we begin with, this is kind of the beginning of the church and the orders that we currently see, right? The apostles, um, like next Sunday, Bishop Eric will be here. So his role is to safeguard the apostolic teaching. And that's one of his primary roles is to make sure that in our diocese, we don't move off the gospel into some false teaching, right? Um, so that's his role, but then he's also the pastor of the pastors. Okay, he ordains priests and deacons. Then you have priests who are over congregations and deacons who serve. Deacon Leslie, we're blessed to be have her here, but her boss is not me. We have the same boss, which is our bishop. Right? And Bishop Eric could say, you know what, Deacon Leslie, I need you, you know, over in Sanger. And, you know, to our great dismay, um, and I'd probably put up a fight and say, no, bishop, no. But she would actually then um, have to follow with the bishop. You know, she would, that's, that's what she signed up for, to be um, at the bishop's uh, disposal to bless the diocese however needed, okay? So, but it all begins with the laying on of hands. Okay, next one. Okay, so these dates are all approximate, okay? So, and this is in your notes, but around 33 A.D., Jesus' resurrection and Pentecost took place, and the gospel goes out into the world. Uh, 33 to 34 A.D., we see in the book of Acts, the first deacons are ordained. Okay. 44 A.D., Paul's converted and begins his missionary work. 49 A.D., uh, Paul's first letter written is the first New Testament document. Okay. Um, and on some New Testament documents, they're not, you know, all agreed on exactly which date and which one was the first. But um, some think that Galatians was the first letter that Paul wrote. Okay, 67 A.D., Peter and Paul are both martyred. 70 A.D., Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. And this is how, um, if you think about it, a lot of uh, New Testament documents are dated 
because if they're writing to churches and they don't make any mention of the temple being destroyed, right, which would be a monumental, you know, event, you know, they, they date them, then this likely happened before 70 A.D. Okay, 99 A.D., all of the New Testament documents are finished. Okay, so within 66 years uh, Jesus of Jesus' resurrection. Now, believe it or not, I think we did this in the Bible one. That is, um, the New Testament is the most authenticated ancient text of any ancient text that exists, right? That it hasn't been changed. But if you talk to some people, you know, they've watched maybe the History Channel or other things, and they'll tell you, like, you know, it's been rewritten so many times. And it's actually no. Like the textual criticism, the study of ancient texts will say clearly, no, it hasn't been. Okay. All right, next one, Tim. 100 to 311 A.D., the church is persecuted, but it spreads. Okay, it spreads in amazing ways, especially given the persecution. 312 to 313, um, Emperor Constantine converts. He's out fighting wars, and he has this vision of this cross going forth and bringing victory, paints a cross on his shield, um, gets victory, converts, and then the Edict of Milan, what that did was now Christianity is legal in the Roman Empire, and you get a tax break. Well, I don't know if you got a tax break, but all of a sudden it became legal, and since your emperor is a Christian, it became cultural to become a Christian, whereas before you could very well lose your job, lose your life. So there was a real um, shift that took place. Um, some people, like John Wesley, viewed the worst thing that happened to the church was Constantine converting because he said that once you took away, you know, the costliness of what it meant to follow Jesus, and it, you see that now the gospel becomes co-opted by worldly power which is partly what we saw in that video, the Pope had all this power, right, um, over, you know, the known world at that time. It was not uncommon for him to write annulments of marriages at all, especially when it was about the issue of, of having an heir. So that wasn't the big deal. He was just playing a political game because he wanted uh, to keep good relationships with the king of Spain who was the father of Catherine of Aragon, who Henry VIII wanted to get an annulment from. Okay, so we see there the end result of this. So 325 A.D., the first church, of, first church council in Nicaea, and this is where we get the Nicene Creed, which we say every Sunday. These are the following four, 381, 431, 451 A.D. Count, are the councils in Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. Um, and these are considered the first four united uh, church councils, and these are the ones that we acknowledge. In 1054, we see the church splits from the east and the west. All right. So how many of you go to the Greek food festival? You guys ever been to that? Yeah. What? You miss it every? Yeah. Oh. Uh, at St. George's, right? Isn't that the name of it? Okay. Or how many of you have noticed uh, the beautiful Coptic church on White Lane, right? Okay, so those both come out of this split. They're part of the Eastern Church, okay? Um, and actually, this kind of shifted because the, the bishop in Rome wanted to declare that, you know, at the center of the church should be in Rome, right? Well, they, they weren't too pleased with that, and then here's the split. 1378, the Western Schism begins, and at this time, there were two people claiming to be the rightful pope of the church in the West, okay? Um, so you, that sounds very political, and it was. Uh, 1517, then we have the Protestant Reformation begin, okay? So the further we get away, the more power the church gets in a worldly sense, we see the more the teachings, the essence of the gospel is getting lost or drawn away from the people. And that's what the Reformation brings back. Did the Reformation have its faults? Sure, 
right? I mean, the, the demolition of the um, monasteries and, and these types of things, um, and kind of, they almost let the baby go out with the bathwater, but it's, it's a natural pendulum swing, right, from being one way, right? They don't want to have anything connected to Rome to this other side, and then now where we're at today, we're a little bit more in the center. All right, any questions so far up to this point? All right, next one? Okay. So now when we think about specifically the church in England, so um, it was brought to Britain by traders. There's evidence, um, archaeological evidence, that found an early church uh, there or a place of worship as early as 150 AD. Okay. Um, the Celtic Christianity um, be, you know, existed in the islands around 150 to 663. Okay. Now, there's um, anybody familiar with this kind of distinction of Celtic Christianity? We're not talking about Scottish games or going to, you know, green beer on St. Patrick's Day. But any, any familiarity what kind of is distinguishes Celtic Christianity? Anybody read anything about St. Patrick? You have Nate? Yeah, the middle of the quote I read. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember actually. I need to look at this other than like um, Celtic Christianity. Yeah. So in, in one way to think about it, it, you know, they co-opted sometimes aspects of the of the pagan faith that was there and kind of like if you think about it, if there was a pagan site of worship, they would build a church on it. Right. Um, but I think one of the aspects is, is they, they really embraced the beauty of nature, how God works through um, nature itself. Right, and identifying the goodness that still exists in creation. They were huge in the arts, right? If you've ever seen like the Celtic Gospels, um, and huge in uh, kind of communal type living. Um, and so, what we see here, you know, St. Patrick, right? He was, I think, a, a Welsh uh, from a family of clergy, and he was um, kidnapped and taken over to Ireland, right, and kind of forced to be a slave there, being a shepherd, and, and he finally escaped, went back, and had a vision that he was called to go bring the gospel to the people. And so that's, you know, why St. Patrick is such a big figure in Ireland, because he's, you know, largely considered responsible for the conversion of the country. Then you have Bridget, who was... Um, an abbess of a monastery and helped the spread and then St. Columba. And so they had this incarnational approach to mission, orthodoxy, and creativity and liturgy in their structure. Um, and so uh, reading about St. Patrick's really fascinating and there's some really beautiful things in that tradition that uh, we do well to continue to glean from. Okay, so this is just to show that this was, this was the original kind of ethos of the church in England, okay? The church that, the universal church, okay? Next one. Chris? There you go, thanks. All right, so then Catholic Christianity, right? Meaning Western Christianity coming out of Rome, um, Really, in this period at 663 to the early 1400s, uh, Augustine of Canterbury, not um, Augustine of, I'm going to draw a blank, Hippo, um, he came from Rome to kind of assess what was going on there on the island. And, you know, there were some controversies trying to get people because they kind of celebrated Easter at different times and different practices. But he came and then eventually... Um, it, it just, the whole area, 
kind of came under the sway of the Roman Church. Uh, we have Thomas Becket and then Henry the Seventh. That should be Henry the Eighth. Excuse me. Okay. So the difference is structured, highly organized, and largely Roman in theology and practice. So this connection with Rome then is going to cause all the changes that are taking place through the empire to occur there. All right, next one, please. All right, so remember I said centuries before the Reformation took place, right, uh, this priest John Wycliffe in 1384 there in England was writing about all the abuses of the priests and the abuse of the churches and started this movement called Lollards, which was kind of like this grassroots movement to say, you know what, we need to do things differently. We need to get back to the gospel. He thought the Bible should be in English. So, and then you had William Tyndale was one of the first translators of the Bible into English. Edward XI was um, Henry's son. So when Henry died, Edward was this like real young king and he advocated all these reforms. Thomas Cranmer wrote the original prayer book. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury who brought all the real reforms. Then we see um, Mary the I. Anybody know what her nickname is? Bloody Mary. So um, now a drink. Um, but, but that's because she was Catholic. And so when her sickly young brother died and she became queen, now all the reformers were being burned at the stake, right? And so like this was not, it was not a good time, right? Because it's not like the reformers were really embracing of uh, those who still wanted to remain Catholic either. And then uh, Mary's uh, sister Elizabeth um, became queen, and she really settled the church. She was the one that really established, you know, and really moved forward this idea of the via media. Okay. Uh, so the Reformational Christianity, recovering scripture, justification, the centrality of the gospel, the two sacraments, while also holding on to the threefold ministry, bishop, priests, deacons, holding on to the liturgy and a reverence for a tradition. Does anybody, I've, I've used it before, this Greek term adiaphora. Anybody know what that means? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no it, it basically, kind of, it does in a way. It just means um, that it is... Uh, there are certain things that are not of essence, right? They're, they're not essential, right? And so on those things, we can have leniency as long as it doesn't violate scripture, okay? So if it's not super clearly defined for or against within tradition, it's okay to support it as long as it doesn't violate scripture, okay? All right, next one. So now the Church of England after the Reformation, um, here are uh, some of the challenges that we face. So we would say the modern era, right, is kind of the 1700s to the present. Um, evangelicals or low church, right? I think I've maybe made the joke about being low on the candlestick, right? Which would mean um, we're Anglican, but like of those emphases, being evangelical is the most important. So some of the great, uh, like John Stott, great evangelical Anglican, right? I don't think I ever saw pictures of him wearing a collar. He'd wear, you know, a suit. Um, just really focused on God's word and, and the mission. Um, so formal Protestant worship, word and sacrament. Then you go into the 1680s, you have this latitudinarians or this broad church. We're, we're trying to be as comprehensive. Um, Formal Protestant worship, but trying to reconcile science, and then also an emphasis on social action. Okay, um, then moving into the 1730s, evangelicals again, and mission and holiness becomes a big focus. Right, so global missions. Um, who can tell me why there are Anglican churches throughout the world? And this is a, actually a history question. 
Nope. The British Empire, right? So like the United States was a colony, there were colonies in India, Africa, you know, um, and the areas where there weren't huge colonies like South America, because that was mostly Spain, the Anglican church isn't as big as in these other areas, okay? So, um, so they're, they're colonizing, but then they had missionaries who wanted to go to these colonies and bring the gospel. The reason why those churches have exploded is because they moved towards indigenous leadership. Okay, so, um, and the experience then of the Holy Spirit and holiness, um, anybody participate in any church traditions that would be part of the holiness movement, you think? Okay, yeah, okay, and so in this sense, it kind of finds its, its beginning with um, John Wesley, who was an Anglican, and this kind of lets you know the state of the church because he was going out to the coal miners and preaching the gospel outside of a church, and he would do whatever he could to reach people wherever they were at, um, the formal structures of the Church of England did not like him, and they kicked him out, right? And so that's how Methodism started, was because, you know, the Church of England was not in an overall healthy place to accept something new like that. And then we see in the 1830s, the Anglo-Catholics and the high church movement kind of really comes to the forefront, which um, made the evangelicals very worried and concerned, um, not the best things written and spoken about at that time. But this was a, a sense of bringing back more formal Catholic worship, starting to have Eucharist, you know, weekly, um, and acknowledging kind of the, just the beauty of worship in a sense okay and asceticism like taking more seriously certain practices spiritual practices they were really big going into the slums like during you know the industrial revolution trying to build you know some beautiful churches so that people in the midst of all of this just you know pollution and all this just congestion would have a place to go and encounter the beauty of god because their lives, it was hard to find it, okay? Any questions about those? Okay, and, and today we seek to try to embrace the best of all. All right, uh, next one. Okay, so Anglicans in America. 1579, the first Anglican service held in the United States. Well, I'd say North America, because it wasn't the United States then, was it? Uh, 1776, it's illegal to pray for the King of England. Why would that be? Yeah. The revolution, right? Yeah, so Anglicans didn't become popular right now, right? Because they were tied to the king, okay? Um, in 1789, they declared independence from the Church of England and declared themselves the Protestant Episcopal Church. Okay, so with that clear distinction, the Protestant Episcopal Church, which one do you think was kind of more popular, evangelical or Anglo-Catholic? Yeah, evangelical, right? Um, so they later came back into the Anglican Communion, right, and then became a part of the global Anglican Communion worldwide, which has the Archbishop of Canterbury as his head. Um, do we have a pope? Okay, all right, next one. So, I probably have shared this. Uh, I know a guy, he was a church planner and kind of missions guy. He was a part of the Episcopal Church. And he went to a big uh, like church planning conference or a church conference, uh, maybe church growth conference. And so he wanted to go up and talk to the guys, probably led by some, you know, Southern Baptist or, you know, someone who was very engaged in written books and, and so he had some questions for the guy, and um, he went up, and he, uh, the speaker said, hey, um, so what church are you a part of? And he said, I'm a part of the Episcopal Church. And he said, oh, the Bonsai Church. The Bonsai Church? He said, yeah, you know those beautiful trees that are really small? And you kind of, every opportunity for growth, you trim it to keep it looking nice. 
So that's, that's quite an insult if you're at a missions like church plant conference because he was saying like your primary focus is just looking good rather than, you know, um, you're not outward focused. So, um, and that, you know, any critique, there's some truth to it, but not full truth, right? Um, what began to happen, though, is the Episcopal Church in the 1960s began to deny Orthodox faith. Okay, there was actually a bishop up in the San Francisco area who wrote a book that really was unorthodox, right? And yet they never did anything, the National Church never did anything to acknowledge that or censure him, right? Here's a man who, in his role as a bishop, is intended to safeguard the apostolic faith. And yet he's writing a book that is undercutting orthodoxy. Well, that happened, and they never did anything else. And so these types of things began to happen more and more. In the 1970s, they ordained women to the priesthood without global consent, right? So the idea, if you're part of a global family, you don't make unilateral decisions without everybody agreeing, okay? And so they did that. Rather than waiting to see what the rest of the church said, this is what we're going to do, they went ahead and did that. In, 19, in the 90s, they began embracing cultural sexuality norms, right? So whatever the culture saying, that's what they were beginning to embrace. And so in the 2000s, what really kind of broke the, the straw of the camel's back is they ordained an openly gay bishop, and they began to embrace kind of religious pluralism, right? At one point, and I, I need to be very clear, this is not true of every clergy member in the Episcopal Church, nor every Episcopal um, Episcopalian, right? This, these are moves that were taken at the top level. You know, there sometimes there are people sitting in congregations like ours, small, and they're not even aware of some of these things, right? But what happened is there was uh, like the equivalent of the Archbishop of the Episcopal Church uh, actually said, you know, um, Jesus is a way, um, not the way. Okay, that, so you can see that there, there become some great problems there. At the same convention where they, um, you know, confirmed the consecration of this openly gay man who had been married, had children, got divorced, and then um, united with a, a partner. Um, they also undercut the status of biblical authority. Um, like there was actually a resolution that was passed that not saying that the Bible is our ultimate authority. So and then they went on to bless same-sex marriages. Here again, we need to understand the context of being a part of a global communion because when these actions were taken, there were actually churches, Anglican churches in Africa, that were burned because they were in Muslim countries, right? And they're like, oh, you're connected with them, and therefore, you believe this too, okay? Which is part of the sense of you make decisions as this large family, okay? So um, all of this ultimately led to the Anglican Church in North America being developed because they said we want to be under godly oversight. And so many churches in the Episcopal Church left. Um, and like our whole diocese left except for a few congregations. And ultimately, that's how we ended up in this trailer rather than the building that we used to own because when they made that decision, the Episcopal Church sued for the property. They said, people can leave, but buildings stay with us, which actually wasn't even, yeah. It, the way our structures are written, that isn't how it would be, but that's how the lawsuits went. They said, you're just like the Catholic Church. Everything's owned by the National Church. So, Any questions about this? This is kind of a messy part of our past. I, yeah, recent past. Yeah, like I don't, um, yeah, it's... Yeah. Oh. Last time I was Oh, they said Mother Jesus. Yeah. 
I will say this. God is um, non-gender, right? I mean, he, he embraces both because we were created man and woman in his image and likeness, right? So in that sense, God the Father, Father is a term which we can understand, but God's got to be bigger than our understanding of gender, right? But there's no denying Jesus was a man, right? I mean, that's just really clear. So all of this, you know, the seminary that I went to was founded in the mid-70s because of this sense of, hey, we need to have an evangelical seminary. There's things that have been shown. You know, a lot of mainline denominations have suffered, right? And I actually saw this study that during the Vietnam War, the um, rate of acceptance into seminaries in the mainline denominations shot up, right? And so this one um, guy said, well, that's because there were people who didn't want to go to war. They were embracing kind of the cultural norms of kind of the backlash against the war. So I can go to seminary, not go to war. And so they took their whole kind of cultural ideals about, you know, pushing back on all of the structures into the ministry. And then you fast forward that and you see... Uh, a church, and this has happened in most of the mainline denominations, that becomes more focused on what the culture is baptizing than what scripture has to say. Okay, so the seminary I went to was kind of a pushback. We need to, you know, make sure that we have people who believe the Bible who are being ordained. Okay, next one. Okay, any questions on any of this? I just feel obligated. I've got to go over this so you understand what you're kind of you know, connected to. Um, so the ACNA, founded in 2009 after several different movements, in, uh, like renewal and reform movements in the Episcopal Church didn't succeed in turning the tide. Global South Anglicans, meaning they were in uh, south of the equator, Africa, Asia, and South America, um, stepped up and said, you know what, we'll, we'll have you under our province. So interestingly enough, those that the church at one point went to evangelize, their leadership now is more orthodox and has sought to come evangelize the United States and the West. Okay? And so we're under their authority. Okay, all right, next one. All right, so to understand how the church governs itself, Right, it, the goal is to always be accountable and collegial, working together. So you have the archbishops, and that's the primates, right? Not primates, um, and they are over a province, which is a region. So we have an archbishop who is over North America. Okay, um, he's well, well. We'll see the terms. Then you have bishops who are over dioceses, which are regions, right? Our diocese goes from Bakersfield up to Loomis, which is just a little bit above Sacramento. And we encompass actually just to the other side. We have a church in like Lone Pine and Bishop, um, and then a church plant in Reno and one in Nevada. But I mean, we're basically the San Joaquin Valley, okay? So we have a bishop who's over that, and then you have priests and deacons who serve within congregations. And then, that's, that's, I just wasn't that talented, that should cover the whole bottom, right, is the laity, okay? Because the largest group of ministers in the church are you guys, okay? Um, and you have a voice in how things are done, okay? All right, next one. All right. So, this is different. So, each province governs itself uh, independently. Um, there's 38 provinces with approximately 85 million people. The Anglican Church is the largest Protestant denomination in the world. Each diocese governs itself independently, but in alignment with the province, right? We shouldn't do anything within our diocese that would be unacceptable or contrary to the province as a whole, okay? Um, and then there's four instruments of communion, the Archbishop of Canterbury, right, who is supposed to be someone that tries to bring everyone together in the global communion. 
the Lambeth Conference, which is all the bishops and archbishops that meet every 10 years, then the Anglican Consultative Council every two to three years, which includes laity, and then the primates meeting where the archbishops meet every two to three years. Okay, so that's, that's the idea of the Anglican governance. Next, please. So, we have the ACNA governance because the, um, the majority of the world's Anglicans we're in relationship with, okay? But the Archbishop of Canterbury and England has not fully embraced us as being a part of the worldwide communion because they don't want two provinces coexisting at the same time, right? So the, the Episcopal Church is still here, which was in communion with them before the ACNA formed. And to be honest, there's a lot of concerns about the Archbishop of Canterbury's. Um, it's a really difficult to, place to be uh, as far as trying to make some of these larger decisions, right? It would be a pretty big deal to cut off the Episcopal Church, right? Or other provinces that have gone much more progressive. Uh, so... Um, we are connected to GAFCON. There's a write-up in there. That's the Global Anglican Futures Conference. And that is where we look to for our um, leadership. And the, usually the, the majority of GAFCON is made up of archbishops and bishops in the Global South region. Okay. Our archbishop serves for a period of five years. He is a... Um, you know, at the College of Bishops, which are all the bishops in the province gathered together, and when it's time, they pray for a few days, and a new archbishops formed. They don't leave, the archbishop doesn't leave the role of being a bishop over their diocese, though. So they don't abandon their role. Okay. Um, the College of Bishops meets twice a year. You have Provincial Council, which meets annually, which includes clergy and laity, and provincial assembly, which meets every three to five years. Okay. All right, next one. So here's how our diocese is governed. All right, we have our bishop, and then the diocese is broken up into deaneries, okay, different sections, and there's a rural or a rural dean. Ours is Father Carl Dietz, who is at Trinity. Um, this is just ordained members. These are just priests. They meet with the bishop monthly, and then they bring information and share it with the rest of the deanery. And then the standing committee, which includes laity and ordained members, uh, Deacon Leslie is our representative for our deanery. They meet monthly. And so here we're talking about pastoral issues and you know things functioning within the church and growth within the church. Here, uh, the focus is often um, also on the secular things, finances, property, you know, things moving forward with that. Okay. All right. Next one. Okay. So, how does our diocese work? We have congregations. And that we have a vestry or a board, and these are elected laity. They're authorized to make governing decisions over our sexual, or sexual. Did I really just say that? <laughs> over our secular life, uh, which is like spending the funds, our budget, all that type of stuff, property. Um, I am the chairman of the board, but I work for the bishop. Okay? And then diocesan convention, which is coming up. Um, the beginning of November, that happens each year. Every congregation elects delegates that get to go to that, um, and it's based on your size. The larger you are, the more representatives you have. Um, all the clergy attend. There we approve the budget for the diocese for the year, um, and we vote on any changes in our constitution or canons. Okay. You guys see why I kept this to the last one? Yeah. We had a bunch of Mormons at our front door. Yeah. Waiting for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, does she or I need to be there earlier in the Holy Week? 
Um, I will check, and I'll let you know about Bishop Eric. Um, sometimes he may try to get here early just to meet with you guys before the service. So I'm waiting to talk to him. I won't be able to talk to him until Tuesday, but I'll let you know. Okay? No problem. All right. Thank Sounds you. good. Yep. Yeah. Well, you, like I said, that's okay. Well, you see why I, I said I'm le I left this to last. If I did this first, you guys wouldn't have come back to the second class. So, all right. Um, next one, Tim. Come on, let's get this. All right. Yeah, we're done. Wow, that was good. We're done. Oh. So, all right. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. I mean, first of all, is there any questions about any of that? I mean, it's important to know how the church governs because there is this reality that we're an institution, right? We're, we're a group of people gathered together trying to move forward in a direction, and that requires organization, equal representation, all of these types of things, okay? Any questions about it? If you've been a part of a different denomination or things, yep. Others, I yeah. Think, yeah, like not, mm -hmm. not considering us in the belt and ordaining a woman mm -hmm. in the, as a bishop. A, a priest. Mm -hmm. um, what, because obviously we can work things, and mm -hmm. we can see mm -hmm. comments, but what's the, what's the priest do on the preliminary things? It is, um, so I think on a whole, historically, it's been more of the complementarian you know, approach, right? Kind of like the Catholic approach. But Catholics don't even have women bishops, do they? Right? Or women deacons, yeah. But so then, like, so within the ACNA, there are, it's based upon different provinces, right? So I have friends that I went to seminary with, they're women and they're priests, right? So it kind of varies based upon the province. So in that sense, they have an egalitarian understanding of, like, the pastorate, right? That women can serve in those capacities, and they look to Scripture to support that, just as the complementarians look to Scripture to support that. So right now, it's kind of, you know, that's kind of the basis for the ACNA. Our current diocese has historically always been more Anglo-Catholic, meaning that um, our bishop will not ordain, like if Deacon Leslie said, hey, I think I need, I'm being called to be a priest, he would not ordain her to the priesthood, right? But to the diaconate. And so that's kind of a big conversation as to kind of the distinctions there on why one role but not the other, okay? So, mm -hmm. the province, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, well, it, I think it's historically how they've accepted it, right? So, like, uh, Pittsburgh, where I used to serve, um, women priests and, and women are ordained. Uh, my former priest from this diocese, um, who's now Bishop of South Carolina, they ordain women to the priesthood. Um, so it really just does kind of depend. There's also a less regional area, um, where they have women to the priesthood, and they're kind of, uh, it's a non-geographic kind of diocese called Churches for the Sake of Others. Is it a topic that's like defined geographically, as like it's like kind of in the area, but it's really just dependent on the province, province? It's dependent on the, pro well, globally, within GAFCON, it also depends on province. So there are some provinces where there wouldn't be women priests, and there are some provinces that accept women priests. And they did, they did a study to try to figure out what should we do, and um, they made the decision to leave things currently the way they are. Right. So, Nate. Well, but look at the section of California that we represent, right? But, and, but even then, it goes further back to the founding of our diocese by an Anglo-Catholic bishop, right? And so I think that's more probably what set that in, okay? Um, 
Yeah, uh, here's a couple things that I put in here for you to look over. Um, there's a document on the ACNA, their theological statement. Um, hierarchy, what is GAFCON, right? So you understand uh, whose authority we're under. And this is for the first GAFCON meeting. This was the Jerusalem Declaration, and this defines what, what we hold in common. Then on the back here, this is from a book called Anglicanism, and it talks about what the church retained through the Reformation. Okay? Any other questions about that? All right. Um, for that, I just encourage you to review those, and then reading in the Catechism, Prayer, Liturgy, Rule of Life, pages 18 through 21. And then in practice, as you look at what they're talking about, a rule of life, which is just kind of certain practices that you commit to on a daily basis, I'd say consider that. Um, and based upon the things that you may maybe tried, the practices through this um, class, and include those. In your service book, just review the confirmation service just so you know how it flows. And then um, pray God would prepare your heart to receive the Holy Spirit anew and afresh. It's not like he's going to depart from you between now and then, but that is a, <laughs> that is a big part of what takes place in, in confirmation is the laying on of hands, and he's praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life in a new way. Okay? And I will let you know as to whether or not, um, you know, we need to meet earlier for the service. Okay? All right, um, and it probably would be a good idea to have you guys sit, you know, closer to the front because you'll be coming up. Okay. All right. If there's no other questions, that is our eighth class, ninth meeting, and you guys did a good job. Very good. All right. All right. Well, um, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that, um, first and foremost, we're a part of your body, Jesus. Um, and your body transcends our denomination, transcends our congregation, um, and, and embraces it with all our dysfunctions and challenges that we've had in our past in the church um, and the things that we face in the present and the future. Uh, we just pray that we would first and foremost be faithful and that we would be able to accomplish your goodwill uh, in our lives, in our congregation. And we do pray for our bishop and for all the bishops and clergy and our archbishop. And um, during this tumultuous time in the life of your body, as well as within our denomination and the church. And so we entrust it to your care. Uh, guide and, and direct us in a way that would be a blessing to others, that would draw others to you, Jesus, and would be for your glory, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray.